Chapter 6, The Spoiler I had briefly met Don Jardine at Amarillo during the fall of 1966, because as I was leaving, he was coming in. Don was a journeyman wrestler from Canada who had been wrestling for 12 years, and I remember being really impressed with him, so I told Fritz I would be happy to develop his career, and even offered to contact Don, and recruit him myself. I tracked him down in Portland, got in touch with him, and offered him the opportunity to join me in Dallas. Don was leery at first, because he had been taken advantage of by promoters who made big promises to him, telling him he's a big good-looking guy who just needs a little more seasoning. Then, they would just use him as a job guy. I assured him that this wasn't the case, namely because I wasn't a promoter, but also because I had been messed around with, as well, and understood his frustration. I also told him that while I didn't completely trust Fritz von Erich or Paul Bosch, I did believe that together, we could do very well in Dallas. Besides, the worst that could happen is that we didn't like it there, and we could go to another territory. Fortunately, Don agreed to come into Dallas with me and give it a try. I also told him that I envisioned him wearing a mask, which he didn't mind at all. At the time, I was a big fan of comic books, and I really liked this character named the Phantom. He lived in the jungle and wore a mask, so when I built the persona of who Don would be in my mind, I was thinking about the Phantom, a big, agile guy who swung through trees and conquered evil people. That would be his story, he was a great fighter of injustice. Specifically, he would fight against the injustice of men like Fritz and Waldo von Erich, who had banished me from Texas. Don was a big, impressive guy, and when he put on his wrestling outfit, the mask, the long tights, the singlet, and the boots, he looked just like the Phantom. For his name, Fritz, and I came up with the spoiler. I went to Dallas in late August 1967, three weeks prior to the spoiler's debut, to make appearances on KTVT hyping his arrival, and also to talk with Booker Danny Pledges on how I was going to present and promote him. We got to talking about what kind of finishing maneuver he should use, and I thought that it'd be really great to give the spoiler the claw, just like Fritz had. Danny felt that Fritz would put up a roadblock to that, and suggested we consider something else. I was so confident that having two guys in the territory using the claw would get over that I convinced Danny to let me present the idea to Fritz. Danny was a wonderful guy, and let me go for it. We went up to Fritz's office, I laid out my idea and Fritz balked at it immediately. He was protective of his gimmick, and rightfully so. I understood that, but I also had the power of persuasion, or as my grandmother called it, the gift of gab. I suggested that the spoiler could wear a glove, and we can create controversy by having the announcer's question if his claw is stronger than Fritz's because of help from the glove. Fritz was resistant, but took a chance on what I had to say, and agreed to bring the spoiler in with the claw, under the condition that it was called Gary Hart's claw. Personality-wise, Don Jardine and I clicked immediately, and were together just three days before we decided to rent an apartment in Dallas together. Eventually, my girlfriend moved in with us, as well. She was from Fort Worth, and I had met her during my first run in Dallas when I was managing Alan Carl. It was the three of us in that apartment, and we were one big happy family. During that time, Don was going through a divorce. When a marriage breaks up, it's a big deal and I was there for him every step of the way. That experience really bonded Don and I and needless to say, we became great friends. In the ring, he was magnificent. At 6 feet 4 inches and 290 pounds, he could walk the ropes from turnbuckle to turnbuckle like no one I had ever seen. He was a big, agile guy who could do leapfrogs, flying head scissors, drop kicks, and wrestle his butt off, to boot. He was a legit tough guy, and would never wrestle less than 40 minutes, because he had that Luthes mentality. In addition to all of that, he was a guy who made sure I got my money. From day one, Don accepted the fact that I was his manager, and that I was handling his business, taking care of our interviews, and coming up with his finishes. Don trusted me and realized that I deserved my fair share of the payoff. A lot of guys saw a manager as merely someone who would pull a leg or pass a gimmick to a wrestler, but I was much more than that. I took my position as a manager very seriously, because when someone put themselves in my hands, they put their family and livelihood in it, as well. I groomed Don and prepared him for success by watching his matches and giving him feedback afterwards. I wouldn't necessarily tell him what to do, but moreover what not to do. I would point out little things that were hurting him and taking away from the image that I wanted him to project, and then I would compliment him on his positives and lavish praise for the great things he did. I also gave lots of pep talks, and my mantra was, let's do it in the ring. I explained to Don that our only chance for success was to win the crowd over during the time that we left the dressing room until the time that we got back. If we had 15 minutes or 45 minutes, our main priority was to have the best match on the card, and if it took me getting involved, so be it. We had to have the best match, 
and we had to steal the show every night. If we could do that, then we would have success. Our one and only job was to go out and show the promoters that when our name was on the marquee, people would buy tickets. That's all we had to sell. I made Don understand that we were a commodity in the eyes of the promoters, like a box of corn flakes or a can of coke. If we didn't go out there and show the promoters and the fans that we were the best thing going, we would only have cheated ourselves. Now I respect what a wrestler has to offer, but I also know that a wrestler's shortcoming is something that I can fix. That's why I went into managing. Don't get me wrong, I have a lot of respect for someone who can wrestle, but that's a very small part of making money, and wrestling is about making money. I made Don or any wrestler that I chose to develop and manage, comfortable enough so the only thing he had to do was go out and steal the show every night. I made everything as easy as possible for him. My job was to promote him, put him in the right matches, select the right opponents for him, and know when to take him off the main event and drop him underneath to give him a few wins to re-establish him. I developed the spoiler into a major star over a three-month period, and after he defeated opponents like Grizzly Smith, Billy Red Lions, and Klondike Bill, I challenged Fritz von Erich to a battle of the claws. Within a couple of weeks, we had the contest set for the Northside Coliseum, and billed it as Fritz von Erich's Iron Claw versus Gary Hart's Claw. The stipulation was this, Fritz and the spoiler would come to the middle of the ring, slap their claws on each other, and see who would succumb first. No wrestling, just a battle of the claws for 15 minutes. When the time came for the contest, they slapped on the claws, and the spoiler instantly went to his knees. Then he struggled back up, and brought Fritz to his knees. The building was going nuts. These two guys were sweating like pigs, and all they were doing was the claw. I had never witnessed anything like it before in my life. At the end of the 15 minutes, Fritz was bleeding, they were both worn out, and the contest went unsolved. After the contest aired on KTVT, so many people called the station asking for it to be shown again that KTVT played it the following week. In those days, re-airing things was just not done so that in and of itself was a big deal. Right then, we knew that the people were begging for a follow-up contest. We set it up, and the Battle of the Claws 2 at the Sportatorium sold out in no time flat. When the night came, and Fritz put the spoiler down with his iron claw, I jumped in the ring with a coat hanger, threw it over Fritz's neck, jerked him back, and started tightening it around Fritz's neck. If you recall I saw Sam Casino use a coat hanger in Chicago, so this was truly inspired by my days with the mob. When I started strangling Fritz, the audience began throwing chairs at me. It wasn't a full-scale riot, but it was getting there pretty quick, so Don and I ran out the side door of the sportatorium. The spoiler worked many times with Fritz, and they were always huge attractions. Business was never better, but after a while, Fritz wanted the spoiler to lose his mask, so we set up a match between Fritz and the spoiler where I put the spoiler's mask on the line. It drew a huge house, and Fritz victoriously unmasked the spoiler. Right after that, business tanked, and the Dallas territory started dying. I implored Fritz, we have to put Don's mask back on. We can't do that, he said. I just unmasked him. I don't care. Business is horrible. Besides, the spoiler without a mask is like you without the claw. He continued arguing with me for a while, until I said, we really need to put the mask back on Don. If not, I think it's time for us to leave. At that point, Fritz gave in. We put the mask back on the spoiler, and within two weeks, business was sky high again. Even though Fritz and I would argue about certain things, he knew that I had a great mind for angles, and would often come to me for ideas. One time Don and I were sitting in the dressing room when Fritz sauntered over. He wanted to start a new angle with a couple of wrestlers, and asked if I had any ideas. I gave him a couple of suggestions, and when Fritz walked away, Don chastised me by saying, Gary, don't give Fritz any of your ideas unless he pays you for them. Much like when Jim Myers told me not to give my ideas away in Michigan, Don was spot on, and that was a great lesson. I got along with Fritz for the most part back then, and his sons really adored me. Fritz was an only child, and his wife Doris's only brother, David, had died in 1958, so their sons didn't really have a lot of uncles. They called Waldo their uncle, and one day they told their dad that they wanted to call me uncle, as well. At that point, I became Uncle Gary to the Von Erich boys. The Von Erich boys were so lovable, and I used to take 10-year-old Kevin, 9-year-old David, and 7-year-old Carrie for haircuts, out for sodas, or just to the parking lot to play baseball or football. They would love to tell me how when they grew up, they were going to wrestle me in the ring. We would kid around and laugh, and I had a good relationship with all of them. Little Mike was just three at the time, and they were all good boys and a lot of fun to be with. Carrie was the biggest spoiler fan of all time. 
On one occasion, Kerry was at the matches and his father was wrestling the spoiler. Kerry was sitting at the timekeeper's table cheering for the spoiler, and someone had to go out and tell him to tone it down. Kerry and I also had a little claw game, where he would try to put the claw on my head and I would cover my head, so he would put it on my belly. Luthez was scheduled to come through the territory, and Danny Pletches told me that he was booking him in a few matches with the spoiler. Lou had a reputation for hating gimmicks, and his definition of gimmicks included managers and masked men. All the guys in the locker room were taunting us that Lou would come to town and kill our gimmick, so Don and I were on our best behavior for his first night in. I went to ringside, and even though I was never a guy that just sat down, I stayed in my corner and did nothing while Lou and the spoiler wrestled. The next few nights, I did the same thing. On the final night in Houston, Lou walked up to me in the dressing room and asked, is the only thing you do sit in the corner? What are you, his shadow? No sir, Mr. Thez, I replied. I just didn't think you would want me to get involved in any of your matches. Lou gave me a nice smile and said, well, you seem like a good kid. If you want, you can jump up on the apron and get involved tonight. I was elated. Luthez just gave me his approval to get involved in his match. That was a big deal. When the time came, I jumped up on the ring apron and grabbed his tights, and he gave me the patented Luthez stare. He was working, but still, it was Luthez, and I nearly pissed in my pants. After that, I worked with Lou many times, and he was nothing but a gentleman to me. Don Jardine, like me, had a 12th grade education, but he loved to learn. He was fascinated with Southwestern history, and was a lover of literature. He's also an accomplished poet, and wrote a poem about us that I would recite on our interviews. The poem goes like this. We're a perfect team, the spoiler and heart, we both do our job, we both do our part. He watches them and dares them, I rip them and tear them. I'm all muscle, and he's all heart. Needless to say, Don is a very interesting, complex man. In addition to serving as his manager, the spoiler and I formed a pretty formidable tag team in the territory, eventually winning the American tag team title. That was the first, last, and only title I would ever hold. Titles meant something to the fans, and it did to some of the wrestlers, but I never put too much stock in them. Don and I didn't particularly care for that particular title, because it was a trophy and we had to carry it around in a wooden box. Don and I would leave it in every dressing room in Texas hoping it would get lost, but sure enough, the next night, some referee would come parading the trophy box into the arena. Johnny Valentine and Wahoo McDaniel also came into the Dallas territory around this time. Johnny Valentine had the persona of someone with no sense of humor and as someone not to be messed with, but he was completely different once he knew you. I knew him since I was a kid in Chicago, and over the years I got to know him very well, and we had some great times together. Johnny and I also had a lot in common. For example, we both loved music. Sure, his favorite was opera, and mine was rock and roll, but we were passionate about our music. We also both loved literature, Western history, and the Civil War. He also had a wonderfully warped sense of humor. Just for the heck of it, he would walk around the dressing room, drop his pants, squat, and leave steaming piles of turds in random areas. Everyone had to watch where they stepped because they never knew where Johnny would leave the little memento. One night, we were out drinking in Laredo, and Johnny was pretty gone. Johnny, Don, and I shared a hotel room that evening, and during the night, he thought it would be funny if he pissed in Don Jardine's boots, but he actually went in his own brand new pair of boots. Johnny had an apartment in downtown Dallas overlooking Commerce Street, and one night, he had me and my girlfriend over for drinks. Johnny's wife and kids were there, as well, and we were eating, drinking, and having a good time. There was a very noisy and rowdy crowd downstairs, and when Johnny got fed up with the ruckus out on the street, he got a devilish look in his eyes. The Valentines had six mink cats, and kept a cat litter box in the corner of their apartment. Johnny thought it would be hysterical to empty the cat litter box off his terrace and onto all the noisemakers on Commerce Street. Now, this was not your ordinary size litter box. It was a steamer trunk, and it must have had four months of droppings in it. Johnny was intent on pulling this off, so he and I hefted it up, carried it out to the balcony, turned it upside down, and tried our hardest not to drop the trunk, fearing we would kill someone down there. From 17 floors above, all of the cat litter and cat droppings went down on all the people. One night, Don and I went to Corpus Christi for promoter Joe Blanchard. The place was packed, and when the envelopes came back, Don saw Johnny and Wahoo counting their cash, and realized they got more than we did. He came to me in a rage, screaming, what's going on? They were on the undercard and are getting paid more than we are. I tried explaining that we don't know all the facts, and that it could be reimbursement for their transportation, or they could be getting paid for a prior match. I told him not to jump to any conclusions, but Don insisted on talking to Joe about it. 
we went into Joe's office, and Don told him that he wasn't happy with our payoff. Joe just sat there with his feet on his desk, smirked, and added fuel to Don's fire by challenging, well, I've been pissed off, but never pissed on. Don grabbed Joe's legs and started dragging him across his desk, and in a flash, I jumped in between them and calmed Don down before it got ugly. Joe was real shaken up, and immediately gave us an extra $100 each. So Don was right, Joe had thieved us.